Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to give everyone else a few more minutes to join. Welcome. We're just waiting for some additional attendees to join us. We're going to give them a few more minutes. We'll give everybody one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, well, we're expecting a few more people, but we will let them trickle in. Thank you so much for joining us today at our second author event. Today, we will be hearing from Sarah Coomber, author of The Same Moon. For those of you who don't know me and U.S. JDA, my name is Bahia Simons Lane, and I was a jet in Gunma Prefecture from 2005 to 2007. I'm the executive director of US Jet AA, the United States Jet Program Alumni Association. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering US Japan relations by supporting the network of Jet alumni, including Jet AA chapters, individ and in individual alumni, and some current Jets. Before we get going into uh, Sarah's reading and hearing more about the book, I do want to thank our sponsors, the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership and Claire, the Japan Local Government Center. Most of you probably know about Claire because they are one of the organizations that runs the JET program. Um, but both of these organizations are wonderful organizations based in New York City, and they support US-Japan relations from kind of the Japan side, focusing on greater understanding between our two countries. Today, we will be using the Q&A feature for questions. So if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use the Q&A button, which is usually at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on which version of Zoom you have. Please type your question in there at any time, and we'll get to them at the end. We also had some pre-submitted questions, and we will be answering those first. Now, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Sarah Coomber. Sarah is originally from Minnesota, which is where she now lives, and she's currently working as a communications and writing consultant and coach. She teaches holy yoga, which explores the nexus of yoga and the Christian faith. Now, when Sarah was 17, she spent a summer in Yamaguchi, living with the Maeda family and beginning her love of Japan. Since then, she taught English in Yamaguchi on the JET program from 1994 to 96, and taught Japanese language and dance to children at an immersion camp in Minnesota, and has studied the Koto. Many of these experiences and what they meant to her are detailed in her memoir, The Same Moon, published by Camper Press. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Sarah to uh, introduce her book and share a uh, reading with us. Thank you, Bahia. <laughs> it's great to have all of you on here with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this book really was a passion project for me. I've worked on it for many years and um, just to have it out there and in people's hands is really a joy. Um, I, because I know that a lot of you are former Jets or maybe current Jets, I thought I would share a passage that's um, kind of focused on the Jet experience of arriving in Japan, something that we all shared, and there were probably some similarities. Um, 
so this is towards the beginning of the book and basically um, the book begins with me um, going through an early life divorce. <laughs> I was married very briefly and divorced by age 24 and I kind of saw uh, the JET program as my what would you say, springboard to the future. <laughs> I just wanted a big change. I wanted to leave everything behind. And um, so that's how I ended up heading on the JET program. Um, so I guess I'll just start by reading this, this section. Um, and basically I am kind of jumping around from the first, in the first few chapters, just to give you a sense of, you know, how it was for me arriving in Japan and then heading into this very rural area. So this chapter that begins um, is titled, Welcome to Girl Land. I arrived in Japan with a herd of young foreigners, thousands strong, all of us recruited to help Japanese school children learn English. We were bused en masse from Narita Airport to Tokyo's swanky Keio Plaza Hotel, where we spent our days holed up in conference rooms and banquet halls, getting oriented to the goals of the JET program primarily to bring conversational English and Western culture into classrooms that had long been focused on teaching English grammar for the all important university entrance exams. Our other job was to learn Japanese culture. We were bombarded with advice, dress conservatively, expect the students to be shy, get involved with your community, encourage your co-teachers to use English in the classroom, learn Japanese. At the end of each day, we were loosed from the hotel halls to hit Tokyo's crowded streets, our eyes pinwheeling, faces bobbing like helium balloons as we tried to make sense of Tokyo's blinking, buzzing streets, each lit like a collection of oversized light bright toys, brightly colored pegs pressed in patterns against the black backlit screen of evening. We wandered mazes of nightclubs and pachinko parlors, restaurants and shops, young male hawkers calling and waving people through doors to who knew what was awaiting them. Jaded looking young women with little girl voices, handing out packs of white tissues, plastic wrapped and advertisements for phone services, electronic stores and clubs. I was not as lost as many of the new Jets, the majority of whom had never been to Japan before or studied this language. At least I had spent a, summer, a high school summer there and part of a college winter vacation. Soon though, I flew with several other jets out of Tokyo's din and into Yamaguchi's Ube Airport, roughly 500 miles to the Southwest. On arrival, we herded up, scanning the arrivals area for our new supervisors and colleagues, where the other jets each found one or two representatives there to welcome them with quiet smiles and bows. I saw a trembling white sign several feet long. Welcome Ms. Coomber, it shouted. When I smiled in recognition and waved at the men holding it, an enthusiastic, almost rowdy contingent of maybe a dozen fluttered back excitedly. One of my new handlers, gray haired and grinning, jumping up and down in his black leather loafers. I imagine I looked garish that day in my red knit tee, flower pattern pants and dangly earrings as I approached the crowd of navy suited white shirted men. My new posse quickly absorbed me into its fray the other jets fading out of sight and mind as I was greeted with bows and handshakes, relieved of my bags and piled into a caravan of cars in what resembled a friendly kidnapping. I was Shu Hocho's first ever jet, and I imagine that for this crowd, my appearance was an accomplishment. Having successfully imported their very own foreigner, they had joined a new class of towns. Our parade wound its way over low passes and through long tunneled mountains to Shu Hocho, the suffix cho, literally meaning town. And when we arrived, I, not knowing then that cho was less a descriptor than an administrative category, quickly decided that the town label had been used pretty loosely. Most recently, I had lived in Minneapolis, St. Paul, but I had grown up in the small city of Moorhead, Minnesota, which is connected by bridges over the Red River to Fargo, North Dakota, the resulting community having a joint population of roughly 100,000 in the 70s and 80s. So I knew cities, big and small. And I was also very familiar with towns, having spent countless childhood vacations on car trips through what many consider flyover land. Are we there yet? Crossing the wide open North Dakota plains to visit one set of grandparents in Saskatchewan and the hills of Wisconsin to visit another set of grandparents in Illinois. I had gathered more data on towns as a student at a private Lutheran high school in Fargo. 
North Dakota because we played class B sports against schools of similar size in blink and you miss them towns throughout the Eastern part of the state. In my experience, a town was a place defined by a few consistent features clustered together, a bar, a church, a post office, a cafe, a school, some homes, and usually a phalanx of grain elevators and a gas station. In this Shuho town, even if you were to substitute shrine for church and forget the grain elevators, the place felt less like a town than a rural area containing several sleepy constellations of homes, mom and pop shops, and a primary school in each. These neighborhoods were separated by small mountains from one another and from the central administrative area of town offices, small restaurants, and a high school. I had a hard time believing that 7,500 residents called this Cho home. But although it was not what I had expected, it was so different from the place and life I had fled that I loved it immediately. That sunny arrival day, everything was fresh and new, and I was a blank slate to my handlers, having suddenly shed my identity of melancholy divorcee, of poor graduate student. I went from office to office, meeting local leaders and others in a blur of polite bows and pleasantries, dozo yuroshiku onegaishimasu, and tiny cups of green tea. Finally, I arrived at my apartment building with two men, Sato Kakaricho, a mid-level Board of Education staff member, and my immediate supervisor, Sasaki-san. Similar to so many characterless apartment blocks that pepper Japan cities and towns, the outside of this building looked like a giant white box, the dimensions of a 10 ream paper container with windows. But after we climbed the outdoor staircase and walked along the second floor balcony, my handlers turned a key in a pale green metal door and suddenly there I was at home. We removed our shoes in the entryway and stepped up into an airy apartment that stretched the depth of the building from front door to back balcony and proved to be a combination of Eastern and Western styling. Sliding doors and slamming, hardwood floors and lightly textured wallpaper to Tommy matted rooms with wood grain ceilings. It was the very apartment I had seen in the photographs they had sent me and it really was all mine. My new home was filled with brand new furnishings from a black twin bed with lights on the headboard to a kitchen rug stitched with the words joyful cooking to an electric stapler sitting on a shiny dark wood desk. And it was quickly apparent that most every object for which it was possible to choose a color had been selected in pastel pink. Pink toilet, pink bathroom sink, pink rugs, pink fuzzy floral blankets, pink sheets, pink jug to hold hot tea water, pink ironing board, pink hangers, pink dishwashing tub, and if memory serves, pink vacuum cleaner. Girl land. Was this the impression my new employers had of young American women that we wrapped our single lives in soft pinks like little girls? I doubted they knew of my divorce. Or did this reflect their experience of Japanese women? Had their wives suggested creating a pink palace? Or did it belie my supervisor's hope that my presence in their schools and their community would be as innocuous and gentle as a baby girl's? Spoiler alert, it wasn't. Or perhaps this pinkness contained the complexity of that rosy color I would learn to love in ukiyo-e, pictures of the floating world. These paintings and woodblock prints emerged in 17th century Japan and depicted the people and happenings of the walled off entertainment districts known as floating worlds. Here, the ruling Tokugawa shogunate would turn a blind eye to social class, warrior, farmer, artisan, or merchant, and release visitors from class-based restrictions. In the floating world, people were allowed to live whatever life they could afford, enjoying kabuki theater, bunraku puppet theater, the company of courtesans, sumo wrestling, and other pursuits, but only in these places. Woodblock printing emerged in the floating world as black ink on white paper and evolved in the 18th century to include multiple blocks, each adding a new color. Pink and green were among the earliest, their simple hues implying a full spectrum of color, a full spectrum of life. Arriving as I was from an unhappy couple of years enduring similar colors, black, burgundy, and green, what my ex-husband and I had settled on as compromise colors for items on our wedding gift registry, the pink felt like an elixir. Like the commoners in the floating world, I could adopt a new non-divorcee identity, a fresh pink identity in Shuho Cho. I could commit to the pink. 
I could own the pink. Utskushidas, I told them. It's beautiful. So before I came, there was an introductory letter from the Board of Education and the head of the Board of Education had allegedly written it. <laughs> and his name is Mr. Shinoda. So Mr. Shinoda's introductory letter had informed me that the apartment I'd be living in was owned by the Sumitomo Cement Company. But I had not understood that the three-story building I now called home was actually the company dormitory for the local branch of Sumitomo Cement, a multinational corporation. Every single one of my neighbors was affiliated with Sumitomo, either as an employee, the men, or as a wife or child of an employee. And my unit was on a floor where the executives lived with their families. I was the first non-Sumitomo person to live there. And later I would learn the reason why. It was the only rental in town with a Western style toilet. At the appointed time, oh, and then I just have to add in, my host parents came during this first week as I was settling in. They wanted to check out the situation. Um, and it was my birthday. So <laughs> they came up for my birthday. And at the appointed time, uh, my host parents and I locked up my apartment and went downstairs to the party room, the Sumitomo party room, where we sat on the tatami floor before a long low table filled with food, bouquets of flowers, and a banana cake topped with cherries and sliced kiwi and peaches. My host mom sat on my left and to my right was Hideo, a fit looking young man with a kind open face. We embarked on an evening of introductions, toasts, small talk and speeches, followed by good natured jokes and questions about where we all came from and what we were about. I doing my best to keep up, flipping through my dictionary with help from Okasan and soon Hideo. At the time, I did not know that 25 was considered the high end of marrying range, at least by the old timers and perhaps by small towners. And that I would be nudged about settling down and teased about becoming as stale and unwanted as Christmas cakey, Christmas cake which is no longer appealing after the 25th of December. Of course, as a foreigner, I received some special dispensation on this, but that night and into the future, I was re regularly interrogated about whether I had a boyfriend and when I was going to marry as if I could dictate this outcome. And I would not admit that I had only recently become disentangled. That evening, I began getting to know the cement company's local executives and their wives who lived in apartments on the upper two floors around me. The lower ranking single men like Hideo who lived communally, each with a bedroom of his own on the first floor below me. And the nurturing middle-aged Obasan, Mrs. Kawajiri, who had her own apartment on the first floor from where she cared for the young men and managed the building, cooking, cleaning, making ikebana arrangements for the entryway and entertaining Sumitomo men visiting from other branches. I also learned that I had something in common with my new neighbors. We were all transplants to Shuhocho. The Sumitomo employees and their families having been transferred there from all over Japan and I arriving from Minnesota. As I learned my Japanese characters, I saw that the name Sumitomo contained the characters for live as in dwell and friend. For me, the name acquired a welcoming connotation. I lived among my dwelling friends. As the evening continued, Hideo patiently, smilingly helped me negotiate the swirl of Japanese words and comments around me, perhaps even smoothing over my first gaffe. When the head of the cement company branch asked what I thought of rural Shuhocho, I carelessly replied, I like it so much better than Tokyo with all that horrible cement. At the end of the party, my host parents and I retreated to the outdoor staircase that led to my apartment and Hideo, my new ally, dashed after us to place a couple of English language books in my hands, one of which ironically was called Beyond Polite Japanese. The other was a collection of cartoons about a gaijin, a foreigner experiencing a year in Japan, birthday gifts. He smiled his kind smile, nodded his good nights and slipped back inside. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that lovely reading. I know, especially the first part of your book where you're arri well, where you're arriving in Japan with the JET program was so nostalgic for me. You know, even though I went on JET a few years later than you, I could just, it took me right back there. Um, so I'm really excited that you read that you read that piece. And 
what a cool experience living in the Sumitomo having. <laughs> I don't know any other Jets who had had that experience. Um, so I want to uh, get into the question question period. We did have some questions that were you know, submitted uh, ahead of time. And we're going to start talking a little bit more about writing and, and this book. And then we'll um, talk a little bit more specific about Japan in relation to the book. But I was really interested in, you know, why did you decide to write this book? Why did you feel that this was a story you had to tell? Yeah, you know, that's such a good question because <laughs> I mean, even right now, I think, why did I do this? <laughs> it was because um, it became a project that went on for a couple of decades. Honestly, I did start it when I was over there um, and it, it was sort of a, something I had to do almost because I was trying to finish my master's degree in journalism and I had this whole different plan for my thesis project and uh, <laughs> that wasn't going to work out. So I decided to do a series of essays. And when I got back and defended, my advisor said, you should turn this into a book. I'm like, yeah, I should. Okay. And then, but there was just so much more work to be done. And I ended up um, working on it again for a master of fine arts in creative writing. And I kept going on it. And I had this whole other way of kind of looking at it, really focusing on woodblock prints and how I think that's kind of a metaphor for how we get into a culture, you know, like the black and white woodblock print is the first one. And our first experiences are like black and white. We understand or we don't, that's it. There's no nuance. So anyway, I followed that path for several years. And then all of a sudden I realized like, you know, I just wanna share Japan with people. And I wanted it to read like a novel, but to be true. And so basically I just sort of set everything aside and started over and kind of focused more on kind of the love story angle of it. Um, I don't know if this would qualify as a romance, but um, but yeah, I just sort of focused on that because I felt like that was the thread that sort of kept drawing me back to Japan. And anyway, that's I just kind of needed to process that piece of it, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, the theme of finding and losing love is certainly prominent from, you know, from the very, very first chapter throughout the whole thing. So, and I think, you know, at least for those of us who were I guess relatively young uh, going to Japan, you know, we had those experiences of finding and losing love. So um, I found some of those moments, you know, talking about discovering a new love and, and the regrets of losing new love quite, quite touching and profound. It really took me back to certain periods of my life. Um, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, the ukiyo-e angle because I, I think I recall you, some of that does come out, come, come across in the language of the book. I think there was one part where you're talking about how you had gone to Japan, you know, as a student on study abroad and it was like things were in black and white. And then when you came back and you had this different experience living there, it was like things were in color so that you could understand these nuances of the, the Japanese experience in ways that you couldn't before. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so another question, you know, there's a lot of JET alumni authors. Actually, I, I keep hearing more and more about JET alums who are writing about their experiences with Japan and um, or, or writing, you know, books related to Japan. But could you talk a little bit about your process writing the book. I know you, you did it in, you said it took a long, a long period of time. You did it in chunks. How long did it take you to write your book when you finally were like, I'm going to do it? Did you have a schedule? Did you have a plan? Could you tell, talk, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So when I kind of found my, like my novel idea, um, gosh, I lost track of the time it took. It was a few years though, probably that I worked on it. And like, I was workshopping it with a group. Out, I was living out in the Portland, Oregon area at the time. And we were workshopping pieces of it and each other's work. Um, and, you know, basically what I did, is I just set everything aside and just started over and just thought, what's the story that I want to leave people with? Like, what do I want people to know? And, and I think, um, you know, there's kind of, there's, at least two layers in a lot in most memoirs, I think. Uh, there's what's happening in the external world, right? For me, it was going to Japan, it was, it was teaching, it was, you know, dealing with 
challenges. It was it was even the romance piece. That's kind of a lot of external, but there's also an internal world that's growing, and that's there are threads of that that I had to you know pull through um, the book as well. And um, you know it was kind of like getting to know myself, under developing an understanding of who I really was and what I wanted out of life. And that's something that you can just you can't just write that, you know, but it, I kind of tried to have that reflect in the external experiences. And then even at the very end, like I was, I was already submitting it to, you know, agents and that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I actually ended up sitting next to a very senior person at a publishing house on an airplane and talking to him about it. And um, it turned out he was at, I can't remember exactly which publisher it was at the moment, it was a you know Christian faith-based publisher. And just through talking to him, I realized that I had left out the faith piece of it. And so I actually went back through and kind of pulled a thread of that through it because I felt like part of it was seeking something beyond myself, you know? So I, I feel like my process is nothing to follow <laughs> because it was pretty messy. But looking back, um, it just, these layers built on the, they built on one another, kind of going from external to more internal to also including that faith thread. So, Well, it sounds like you took the advice of one of my favorite authors, Stephen King, who says you have to be able to kill your darlings to be able to write, <laughs> right? So you have to be able to realize, all right, this isn't working the way that I want it and give up on what sounds like a lot of work with the EPA angle and figuring this out and going through it, you know, a million times. So yeah. Um, and you can definitely tell you put a lot of thought into the, the writing of this. Um, wow. So uh, for other people, you know, let's say you're other people who want to write specifically a memoir. Is there any, you know, piece of advice you would give maybe related to that uh, internal, external? Um, I never really thought about a memoir in terms of that, but it makes a lot of sense. So what advice would you give somebody else who wants to write a memoir? The first piece of advice is start just start <laughs> wherever you're at, because it's never going to get easier, right? You just start. But the, the second piece really is, um, I think it helps to look at memoir when you're writing it as a series of moments. And, you know, I don't know that I did that all the way through, but a lot of the time I did, I thought, oh yeah, I remember that time at the elementary school after it snowed. And I think, what did that mean to me? And why do I care about this? I'm like, yeah, that was important. It helped me see something, you know, something of my home state in this very different place. I'm like, I'm going to write about that. And so then, you know, that's like a chapter. And then another moment, like this idea, the fireflies um, story that I've, I've talked about before. Um, that was a moment. And I think kind of these moments become like little pearls that you put on the necklace finally. And you're also going to have, you know, the, the line that goes through them. But if you start with the moments, it's less daunting. And you just think about what do I remember most clearly today? Okay, do that. And then as you're doing these moments, um, kind of be listening to yourself and listening to the writing, what's coming out. And as you do them, you'll start to see themes that emerge, you know? And for me, it's themes, you know, were the, the woodblock prints and the faith theme and the love theme and the koto. I, you know, I studied the koto over there. There are these themes that kind of came through and some of them are like external themes and some of them are internal themes, but it just kind of comes with the writing. You just have to kind of just start. That would be my biggest piece of advice. And I would just say too, I actually, um, I recently created a little tool to kind of help people start writing a moment and it's on my website and um, it's sarahcoomber.com slash, and then I've got a US Jet AA page now and um, you can see it on there. It's a little memoir moment thing, but it might help you get started. Great, well, I'm gonna go ahead and link that in the chat and I'll link it again at the end. Uh, I, I love the way you describe that as little moments kind of strung together like pearls. Um, that's so fascinating. I, it makes me wanna, I started writing my memoir about Japan many, many years ago. I guess I should pick it back up. Um, Absolutely. Was there a particular section of the book that you found most challenging to write? 
You know, I was trying to think about that. Um, and I, I don't know if it's a section. The hardest thing for me to write kind of throughout is writing about other people. Like I'm fine with throwing myself under the bus, right? I'll tell you what I did wrong and all that. But it was hard when I was trying to write about some of the conflicts I had with my co-teachers and, and friends and boyfriend, and, <laughs> you know, because you want, I want to be fair above all, I want to be fair. And, um, and that's, it's hard because like some of these people I can't go back to and say, is this right? Or, you know, so I think that is a challenging thing. And, you know, I, I'm a trained journalist. I used to be a newspaper reporter. So for me, making sure everything was absolutely factually correct was really important. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's that writing about people. Yeah, um, I, that makes total sense. I mean, at the same time, you know, when you're writing about yourself and your own experiences, it's so hard to be totally unbiased because we all have implicit, you know, bi biases and, you know, you're viewing, we view the world through our own eyes and the lens of our own experiences. So yes, I can imagine that would be extremely challenging. Yeah. So I want to take, I want to change uh, tactics a little bit and I want to start talking more about Japan and your experience um, for Japan. We had a few questions about that. Um, is there a particular, you know, aspect of Japanese culture that you feel impacted you most? You know, I feel like there's so much um, that has impacted me that I carry with me like every single day. Like even little things about the way my Obachan <laughs> taught me how to do laundry. <laughs> there's little things like that. The way I pour tea, um, there's little things. One of the big facets of Japanese culture that really impressed me was the generosity. I, I think I'll just never get over the generosity of how people opened their homes to me how taxi drivers would help me find where I needed to go and then give me a little gift on my way out the door. <laughs> you know, um, I, actually I'm wearing this, it's a top part of a yukata and um, a woman saw me on the street as I was getting ready to leave. And I, I think I taught her grandchildren and she's like here and she gave me like several outfits just like that as we're walking down the street, you know, this absolute kindness and generosity and actually, I'm sitting here, I'm looking across the room at the koto. Um, my, my sensei over there gave me one of her old kotos because she just said, you've got to keep playing. And I said, I'm not, I'm a pianist, I'm gonna go home. <laughs> and she's like, that's it, I'm giving you my koto. And, and I'm like, okay. And it opened up the opportunities for me to continue to study. And so I feel like her generosity has followed me all these years later because I got to study koto on her koto out in Portland for 10 more years after I left her, you know? So I think that generosity piece. Oh, that's such a great story. And I mean, so many Jets have those stories, these moments of generosity where people are just in Japan, were just insanely generous, just putting themselves out there. Uh, that's so nice. And you still have the Koto today. That's, that's wonderful. Um, what did Japan, what did living in Japan teach you about America? And what did, like, what did living in Yamaguchi teach you about Minnesota? So kind of the macro to the micro. Yeah. Okay. So the America piece, I think what it really brought home to me is how individualistic we are here, you know, and I don't think I realized that before when I, but being for you know, two years intensively in a group oriented culture, I really, I was able to look back and see like, wow, I think, I mean, I don't feel like I'm always a selfish person, although, you know, we all are to an extent, right? But, but being over there, I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, they're always thinking about how is this going to impact my work group, my school group, my club group, my friendship group, my living group. You know, and that's what I came up against later in the book with the Sumitomo, you know, my dwelling friends. Like I was not thinking about the group. I was thinking about my own life and that definitely caused ripples. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think getting to understand that individual versus group culture was so valuable and has really changed how I look at, how I look at groups back here in the States now. 
And as for, you know, Yamaguchi and what showed me about Minnesota, I think, um, and one of the things you can see in, in any part of Japan, I think, is, you know how uh, you go to a station and there's the meibutsu and the omiyage, you know, they've got their special treat of that train station of that town, or they have their special craft that they make in that area. And Yamaguchi is a relatively small prefecture. And yet you could go around, there's all these different things, you know, like all these sub cultures of craft and cuisine. And it kind of blew my mind that there's so many different special things could be in one little area. And then I come back and I kind of think, you know, I, I sort of thought of my home state as being a bit monolithic before. But I realized like, well, I'm actually Canadian American. My mom's from Canada. And so I brought weird ways of saying things to school when I was young and got teased mercilessly. Um, so we had our little subculture of that. And like my husband is um, part of the Finnish American subculture. I didn't even know about them until, you know, years later. And so, you know, I, I realized like, oh, I guess there are so many of these little subcultures everywhere you go. So I think that's what Yamaguchi taught me just to look at more of those, these distinct identities all over. That's so interesting. I feel like when I lived in, in Japan, in, in Gunma, I mean, now I could tell you five different things Gunma is famous for. But, you know, I live in Virginia now. I don't really, I can't think of any like specialties. You know, Gunma is famous for cabbage. I don't know what, what our agricultural production, you know, is here. Um, and that's something I definitely took away from Japan is that everywhere has that thing that they're so proud of, that they identify with the prefecture or the town. And I loved that about Japan. Yeah, yeah. it was really special. <laughs> so I wondered, um, have you been back to Japan after you finished this memoir? And if so, do you feel like writing the memoir changed anything about your relationship with Japan? You know, I was thinking about this. I have not been to Japan since I finished the memoir. It's crazy. Um, 2007 was the last time I was actually there, which is way longer than I ever imagined would be possible, but that's right around the time that we adopted our son. So there you go, <laughs> life changed. Um, but I do feel like I was visiting Japan weekly for years because I was going to um, Koto lessons. And my teacher was an elderly Japanese woman and she didn't speak much English at all. So it was kind of like I was still in it and so I would say, um, I think Japan continued to influence how, or, yeah, Japan continued to influence how I was writing my story the whole way through, largely because of her. And also, you know, being in touch with my host family from high school still, um, meeting up with them. And actually, I met up with them in New York a few years ago for touring, which was a kick. Um, so, I mean, I feel like there's, Japan has still been influencing my writing. I don't know. We're, we're, we were scheduled to go last year back to Japan, and I am very curious to see if I have different eyes for it now after spending so much time thinking about it. So to be continued, I'll have to <laughs> check in with yeah. you later. Well, you definitely, I think you need to go back and uh, hopefully you'll come back, write a blog post about it and share it with us so that you can share it with everybody who, who read your memoir. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we had a few questions um, coming in. Uh, one question is from the audience is, what is, do you have a favorite chapter of your memoir? You know, I think um, the one that comes to mind immediately is the fireflies chapter where I was over at my friend's house having a make your own sushi dinner. And we walked out and looked at the fireflies and there was just this amazing, amazing swarm of fireflies. I'll never forget it. So that's one of my favorites because it talks to friendship and the natural world and community. So I think that might be my favorite. I also am really partial to um, the epilogue that I put in the second edition of this um, because it kind of tells what happened next, what happened after I left. So and if anybody ends up with the first edition, just let me know and I will send you the epilogue. <laughs> Yes, I have the second edition with the epilogue. So I was like, I thought there was an epilogue. Um, oh, that, that's wonderful. Yeah, so let, let Sarah know, or we can put you in touch with Sarah if you uh, have the first edition and want to read the epilogue. All right, we have another great question from the audience. This is actually something I was very curious about as well. Um, how do you 
you handle writing about events whose memory may have faded somewhat over the years? <laughs> Great question. Uh, yes. So thankfully, my mom saved all of the letters I sent and postcards and that sort of thing. And I printed off all of my emails I sent home. So I had a lot of that kind of in the moment information, which was just invaluable, of course. Um, so that was a lot of it. Um, and I journaled while I was there too. Japan is the only place I've ever been where I've consistently journaled. So take that for what it is. The other thing is like, you know, sometimes we have these memories and you don't have a record, record of it, but you know what happened and you really want to include it because it makes sense with the story. And sometimes what I found, and again, you know, remember I was a newspaper reporter before. So, you know, I was like, oh, kind of white knuckling some of this, but you, know, you just say like, as best as I can remember, or if memory serves, or, you know, you can kind of just say like, I think it happened this way and just be really honest about it. And, and that's okay. Cause then you're still in the land of truth and honesty. And you're, you're acknowledging that you might be filling in some gaps. And I think that's very common with memoir writers because we don't record everything. Oh, and one other thing was very helpful is the photographs. I took so many pictures when I was there. I went through a lot of photos to recreate some of my memories. So, yeah, Good that's fun. great. Um, do, uh, other than your your host family, who you said you have seen in New York since when they, uh, you know, somewhat recently, are there other people from your time in Japan who you kept in touch with? You know. Um, Less and less, it's been what, 25 years? Yeah, yeah. Um, my friend uh, Naoko, who's in the book, we're still in touch, at least with Christmas cards and a little bit, you know, now and then. Um, let's see, she came over actually to visit a couple of times. So that was pretty awesome to have those worlds connect. Um, yeah, there are a couple of other people too that I am in touch with from those times. I know that if I, go back to Shuhocho, which actually is no longer Shuhocho. It's been absorbed by a different community, which was shocking. But um, the last time I went, like I just dropped in and all of a sudden there I am hanging out with Sasaki and seeing Yamamoto-san and visiting my, my Kuniyoshi sensei, my Koto teacher there. So I think that going back, I'll be able to reconnect. Yeah, it's hard as, as time passes, um, but I think there are people who are come into your lives at certain times of your lives and go out of your lives and that's, that's okay. Um, if the important thing is that they were there. Yes. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, your, your time going, you know, going to Japan, you read that passage going to Japan and we've talked a little bit about some of the themes, love um, as one of the key themes, but I was very interested, and I think since we have a lot of dead alumni on this call, uh, I was interested in your stories about your experiences at your school. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might want to just tell us a little bit about maybe one of the experiences that you feature in the book, and uh, just talk, you know, any anyone that you, I think there were a few, um, but anyone that you want to share. Yeah, they all just come popping back. It's like, oh, which one, which one? Um, you know, it, it, it's funny because I went over there and I really didn't want to be an assistant English teacher. I really wanted to be the English teacher. <laughs> you know, I kind of wanted more responsibility than they even wanted to give. And so I looked for those opportunities and, um, okay, like eight, eight memories are coming to mind. Focus, focus. <laughs> um, and I remember though, I kind of made it clear that, yeah, you know, if you need me to go and teach and you're, you're gone for the day, I'll do that or whatever. So I, I had opportunities to teach solo in these classrooms. And, you know, it, it was interesting because um, it'd be different. It'd be different when you're with your co-teacher versus when you're alone. And I remember one time uh, <laughs> I was teaching at, I think it was a seventh, oh, it must have been older, eighth or ninth grade class, right? And uh, I had, I, and I taught with all male teachers. Let me just say that. So I was kind of, I would kind of slip into some of that masculine language that happens in Japan. 
And uh, uh, this one day I was in the classroom and I was trying to get them going on some conversation stuff and it just was not working. And people were loud. It was like, you know, people hanging from the lights practically. I'm like, oh, great. And finally, I just called out, oi, <laughs> as I had seen my co-teacher uh, call out, and which would silence the entire class. And when I did it, though, it silenced them for like a beat. And then everybody just died laughing. And so <laughs> they schooled me in how not to use Japanese when you're a woman. <laughs> oh, that's that's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, so we're coming to the end. Uh, I wanted to, to let everybody know that if you have any final questions, please ask them in the chat or in, using the Q&A feature. Um, in the meantime, Sarah, I was wondering, have you kept up your Japanese language skills since, since you returned from Japan? Oh my gosh. You know, until a few years ago, I would have said yes. So through Koto, like everything is, thanks, thank heavens for Koto. <laughs> through Koto, I definitely did keep up my language skills. Um, but my Koto teacher retired at the end of 2014. So it's been a little bit slim since then, my Japanese practice. But now and then my host sister and I get on the phone or on um, FaceTime or whatever together. And we actually have a goal to start doing it every other week. So she can work on her English and I can do the Japanese. So more Japanese ahead, surely. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds great. That's really the way to do it. I mean, I think we all learn that. <laughs> we learn by doing. Um, yeah. We have another question that's come in. Uh, if you could write another book, what topic would you want to write about? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm actually working on something right now, and um, it's another memoir. And what I'm working on is basically how uh, what happens when kind of a recovering, a recovering perfectionist adopts a child who wants none of it. <laughs> so I'm working on a book kind of about how um, my life changed once we adopted our son. And uh, yeah, it'll take a little while, but, but it's fun. It's starting, to, it's starting to coalesce a bit. So. Well, yeah, be sure to let us know when, when, you, when you publish it. Uh, yeah. How old is your son now? 16. Oh. So, yeah. so <laughs> almost a man. <laughs> I have material, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I bet I bet you do. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I want to just remind everybody that. Um, oh, actually, before we wrap up, we have one more question that came in and we have a little time, so I want to get to it. Um, so the next question, last question is, uh, have you written any fiction? And if so, what genre, what type? Yeah, um, not for a very long time. I don't think I've ever actually published any fiction. So no, no, no fiction. I, I think I'm kind of stuck in the nonfiction realm. It just sort of suits me. But, um, but if I can mention, I mean, if you'd like to check out more of my my recent blogs and that sort of thing, they're on my website and, uh, and there's information there about how to find my book and um, some also some tips for for writing, like getting started a couple of writing prompts and actually some recipes and uh, some of them that were from the book. And I also uploaded um, like a mixtape from that time. So it was actually a tape that I listened to <laughs> back in like 94, 95, somewhere in there. So feel free to peek at that if you're interested. I can't wait for the mixtape. That sounds amazing. I, I actually, I, I threw away all of my cassette tapes, but I saved all the liners yeah. so that I can recreate them digitally. So I think that's so cool. What a fascinating idea. I can't wait to check it out. Um, and for those of you who are listening who want to check it out, I've put the link to Sarah's site in the chat. So you can go ahead and click on that and learn more about Sarah and her book, um, as well as her blogs and everything else she's up to. And also, don't forget, if you like this program, become a member of USJA if you're a JET alum, or donate, or follow us on social media so that we can continue to offer programs like this. So I want to say thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us. I, I really enjoyed your book. Um, for the, I know most of the people have not read it. 
uh, who are on today, I highly recommend picking it up. Uh, it looks like there's a link um, on Sarah's site to get 15% uh, off. Oh, yes. So yes. Readers, if you sign up for her email newsletter, the same loon, love that. Uh, so you can go, go ahead and get a discount. And for all of us who lived in Japan, or even those who didn't and want to learn about Japan, like this book, I mean, it really, it really put me right back into the place I was when I was a jet uh, navigating that world. So highly recommend it. Thank you. Any final words for everybody, Sarah? Oh, well, just thank you for being here. It's, it's really kind of a thrill to, to know I'm talking to other jets and we, we have a shared experience, that's for sure. And just good luck to you all. And I hope to see some of your memoirs out there as well because there are so many good stories to tell from that experience. If somebody is working on their memoir, it would, it, would you be okay if they contacted you for advice or yeah, sounding sure. board or anything? So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Jets help jets, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, contact Sarah if you're writing your memoir. Um, all right, well, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful rest of your night, or I think we have at least one person who's in Japan, so have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Hope you have a chance to read the book if you haven't already. The Same Moon by Sarah Coomber, published by Camphor Press. And have a great rest of your day or night. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.